church. Hope you had a good week. Pray that the Lord blessed you and that we can be a blessing to each other this morning. Over the last few weeks, we have been, over our last few weeks in the study of Acts, we've been looking at the, the first ever pastor's conference in Acts chapter 20. And Paul is addressing all the elders of the Ephesian church. And it is really his, his last farewell address to all of them before he, he leaves them for good. And Paul gives them, and he gives us a biblical job description of what church leaders should be doing. And he explains very clearly that the main job of church leaders is to, is to shepherd God's flock. And this morning we will be reading from Acts chapter 20. If you would stand with me in honor of God's word, we will read from verse 28 through to verse 32, Acts chapter 20. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among you your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. And now I, com I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Father, we ask for your help this morning as we study your word. Lord, we've been told and I've been taught that everything rises and falls on leadership. We think of leadership in our homes as children. We think of leadership in our homes as adults. We think of leadership in the church. We've all had bad experiences. We've all had good experiences. And we know how our lives are affected by leadership. And we pray as we look at this passage in the Bible about church leadership, that you would help us to know what we can expect from our leaders, and Lord, even as members, how we are to respond to them. Lord, we pray for your help. Lord, we see in the scriptures, as we just, just read, you are our chief shepherd. Lord, you are our leader. The Holy Spirit leads us and guides us, and we are all under authority. We understand that, Lord. But I pray, Lord, that if there is people among us, Lord, who still have mistrust for authority, and Lord, even are not willing to submit to you as their final authority, Lord, that you would do the work in their hearts today, and that you would help us, Lord, to bow our knees and our wills to you, the good shepherd of our souls. So we pray for your help today, Lord. Teach us and guide us. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. A couple of weeks ago, Andre uh, Ramos from northern Iraq, he came here and he preached to us from Psalm 13, and he made a, a statement that was shared on our social media platforms that was a very profound statement. He said, we live in a time where how we feel about anything and everything is what is most highly valued, even more than God's objective truth that never changes. Sadly, we do. We live in a day of tolerance where even in the church, good feelings take priority over sound doctrine. If you dare to question whether someone's teaching is biblically orthodox, you will be labeled a heresy hunter or even worse, a, a fundamentalist in the same league with the, with the Taliban or, or ISIS. And despite what the world may have to say, today we are going to see what the Bible has to say about the responsibility of an elder to God, the flock of God, by tenderly warning against false teachers and by staying centered on, on the Word of God. And last week, Pedro preached from Acts chapter 20, verse 28, and he showed us three concerns that the elders must have for the church and for their, their care of the church. 
And today we are going to look at another concern that the elders of the church need to have, and that is to guard the flock. That is the title of my message this morning from Acts chapter 20, verse 29 to 32. But please remember the context of our passage. It's related to the, the local church. And Paul is speaking specifically to the church at Ephesus. And for a person to say that the local church is not re uh, relevant or it is irrelevant and unimportant really is to completely misunderstand the Old and the New Testament and the blessings of elders that we see here being addressed. Pedro also mentioned Hebrews chapter 13 verse 17 last week. And I just want to remind you of that verse that Scripture tells us, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. I know a, a family, not from New Life Church, a family who have been members of a church for years, but have grown increasingly unsupportive towards their pastor. And because of that, they have become increasingly unhappy in their own church, increasingly unhappy in their own family, and in their own marriage. And my advice for them has been from Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17, what, we, what I just read to you. And the reason their, their joy is is fading is because they have forgotten the blessing of, of elders. And they are, they are no longer enjoying the advantage of elders because they, their hearts are, are filled with groaning and complaining and their ears are unable to receive the instruction from God's Word that their heart so desperately needs. And my hope today as we go through the study is that you will see how important it is to be under biblical leadership that is committed to the, the Word of God who are able to receive godly, that you are able to receive godly instruction from. So my first point this morning is from verse 29, and that is the concern for wolves outside the flock. The concern for wolves outside the flock. Look in your Bibles there in verse 29. It tells us, Paul tells us, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Another word for fierce, maybe you have a different um, version. Another translation says savage wolves. Another translation says grievous wolves, all from the same Greek word. So we see the emphasis here on these wolves who are there to do harm, these wolves that are, are there to do damage. But we also see in that verse the word flock. That is not a very aggressive word. That is a, a figurative word to help us understand the, the difference, the contrast between these two types of, of animals. In verse 28, Paul uses the image of a flock to describe the, the local church. And here in Verse 29, he uses another image of a, of a wolf. And a wolf is a, a predator that will eat. A wolf is a predator that will destroy a flock of sheep. And these intruders that Paul is warning us of are, are like a pack of wolves intent on devouring the sheep. And wolves are strong. They are cunning. And they are hunters. We know that. And they are persistent. And they seem to have this boundless energy. And they attack from, from every angle. They are violent and they are, are merciless if they are allowed to creep into the flock. And Paul does not specifically say who these wolves are. We don't know from this passage. But he refers to them as fierce. He refers to them as, as savage. And he tells us that they are from outside the flock. They are not from within inside. They are from outside. And they will not spare the flock from destruction. They are intent on destroying the flock. They are not Christian believers, and they are seeking to destroy God's people. I read an article recently about wolves that were reintroduced back into the wilderness in Montana. 
Um, there in Montana, these wolves had been, the indigenous wolves had been killed off over the many years, and different groups were reintroducing the wolves back into this particular area. And all of the animal rights people were saying what a wonderful thing this was, that these wonderful animals were, were being reintroduced. However, no sooner than the wolves were introduced, the government began receiving all kinds of complaints because these reintroduced wolves were attacking and they were, they were killing all types of livestock all over Montana. And even domestic animals were being killed and people were even fearing for their, for their lives. And these wolves weren't even usually killing for food. They would, for instance, jump into a sheep pen and just critically maul the, the sheep that were there. And because of the size and their agility and the strength of these wolves and their instinct to attack just for the thrill of it, not even because they were, they were hungry, just for the thrill of it. And these animals had immediately become a major menace to the people. And the ranchers soon began to speak out about the fact that they now remember why long ago everyone had killed off all the wolves. And the description of fierce wolves, savage wolves, describes really the, the predatory nature and the predatory motive and character of all of those who are against the church and who are against everything that the, the church stands for. These are not just innocent foes. These are menaces. And these wolves from without may have been government officials, we don't know, who, who despised the Christian faith and fiercely persecuted Christians. It is possible. But it is also possible that these fierce wolves could refer to the, the Judaizers who continually plagued Paul. We know they would come into Paul's churches that he had planted, and now after his departure, they would try and corrupt the church from within. And they taught a very, a very harmful doctrine, a works-based, Torah-keeping gospel message that wasn't the gospel from the Scriptures. But the third possibility is most relevant for us today, and that is the secularists. Now, the secularist philosophy is still very much alive today as it was in Paul's day. And the worldly views and ungodly values that are still infiltrating and influencing churches today in a very, in a very negative way. And the fierce wolves of, of secularism are, are infiltrating our churches. They, it infiltrates our homes through the, through the internet, through, through movies, through social media, through TV, through advertising, through even schools and books and even false preachers. I mentioned a few weeks ago about the observation that Focus on the Family had made regarding um, Disney's last animated kids movie, um, Buzz Lightyear. And they said in their review of this movie that Disney is currently embracing a perspective on same-sex marriage and homosexual relationships that are in direct conflict with what Scripture teaches about the purpose and place of sexuality in marriage between a man and a woman. Secular philosophy. And the secular pressure is really forcing many Christian churches and believers to compromise to their standard of morality, to their standard of sexuality, to their standard of gender identity, marriage and truth and secularist religions. The world is doing everything it can to, to squeeze the, the Christian church into their mold, not into God's mold. These words that Paul wrote to the early Christians in Rome are so needed for us today. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, Paul says to them, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And these are the attacks that we still have today from without. People from without the church that are trying to devour those who call themselves Christians. 
Elders are not only to be concerned, to be aware of wolves from without, but we also see in our passage that we also need to be concerned with wolves from within. With wolves from within. My second point is from verse 30 to verse 31. Our concern for wolves in the flock. Look at your Bible in verse 30. It tells us, And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Verse 31, Therefore be alert. Therefore be alert. Elders and members, all of us in fact, need to be discerning. And we need to be always on the lookout for those who would come from without as well as those who would come from within and lead the church astray. And we have such a disadvantage in our day and age because we allow all these preachers on the internet and on social media to infiltrate our homes and to teach us. And we need to be aware. We need to be discerning. Satan is a, he's a dirty fighter. And he tries to come into every church and disrupt God's work in any way that he possibly can. He sits around scheming. He sits around strategizing ways he could use to cause God's people to fall into some sort of, of sin or division. And Paul is warning us about this. And Paul warns that even from among the congregation there at Ephesus, false teachers would arise, they would come up, and they would try to get a following, and they would pull people away from the local church by teaching false teachings. In his letter to Timothy, remember Timothy was the pastor teacher at Ephesus, and the apostle Paul warned Timothy about certain false teachers, and he even called them by name so there would be no mistake as to who he was referring to. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 20, Paul says, Among these are Hymenius and Alexander, who I have delivered over to Satan, so that they may be taught not to blaspheme. And then he says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, You are aware of the fact that all who are in Asia turned away from me, among whom are Phygelus and Hermon. I did, I did practice this, and Hermon genes, Hermon genes. Now, these are people that were alive at the time, people that were causing problems in the church, and Paul mentions them by name. Paul mentions them by name. I remember once warning the church about a certain false teacher by the name of Stephen Furtick, and in my warning, I used a sermon that he preached from 1 John chapter 4, where he says that, that God broke the law for love. And he goes on to explain that God gave us a law, then as a great display of his love, he ended up breaking that law. And Fertek, he illustrates by using the example of, of a child who has suffered a terrible injury after falling from the monkey bars. And all the way, and, and as a parent, you, you scoop up your child and then you run to the car and you race towards the hospital, and all the way to the hospital, you pass by signs that, that declare a speed limit, but out of love and concern for your child, you ignore those speed signs, and you break the law for the sake of love. And the implication is that you are just breaking the law for the sake of love. And this is what he taught his church. And you can go find that sermon on the internet. And that may be very appealing to our, to our parental emotions, but the problem with that teaching, the problem even with that illustration, is if God broke His own law, He would be unjust. If God broke His own law, He would be unjust. If God broke His own law, He would be unholy. And really, He would be no different to us. He would be a sinner if God broke the law. If God did not uphold the law, if Christ did not fulfill the law, then his sacrifice on our behalf would have been unsuccessful and the law would still be in effect today. And that leaves us without hope, doesn't it? That leaves us without hope. If the law is still in effect, we are still condemned by the law. And really, God is, 
God is just downright evil for promising us a false hope if God is able to break the law. And after that warning, I had a man approach me at the church and he said to me that, that I have no right to, to judge people and to name names and that I was not being loving by using Stephen Furtick's name. And my response to him and my reminder to all of us is, is taken from Acts chapter 20, verse 30 and verse 31. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, be wise, be discerning. And Paul warned Timothy, he, he named names here. He, he called out the false teachers and he named them by name. If the New Testament is full of exhortations to beware and to be on guard against false teachers, then, then we as Christians, and especially as Christian leaders, must also warn people to be aware of false teachers. It is not unloving to warn someone of danger and doom. Now, what kind of parent would not warn his young child not to step off of the pavement into oncoming traffic? And what kind of pastor would not then likewise warn his sheep to be aware of those who are teaching that which is, which is not from God? It is, it is not unloving. And the only measuring stick that God has given to us is His Word. God gave us His Word so that we are to judge everything against it and by it. And if God's Word approves it, we must approve it. If God's Word condemns it, we must condemn it. I remember a bumper sticker I saw as a child on the back of a car once that said, if God's Word says it, I believe it, that settles it. It sounds nice, but, but really, it, that's a little humanistic, isn't it? If God's Word says it, that settles it. <laughs> it doesn't matter if we believe it or not, isn't it? It doesn't matter if we agree with it or not. Our only measuring stick that God has given us is His Word. It's not how we feel. It's not how popular people are. It is His Word. God gave us His Word to help us understand the light from the darkness. And sheep need discerning shepherds that love them enough to protect the flock by standing their ground for the gospel truth with courage and determination. And churches without discerning shepherds are easy pickings for, for hungry wolves. In 2019, a pastor in South Africa, he sprayed his followers with an insecticide to cure them of diseases such as cancer and HIV. And in a, face, a, a Facebook post, he, he says to his followers, by my name you shall drive out demons, by my name you shall pick up snakes, anything you touch receives favor because of the anointing upon you. Can I repeat my previous statement here, folks? Churches without discerning shepherds are easy picking for hungry wolves. So many of those people in this man's congregation ended up in hospital because of the insecticide that he was spraying in their eyes. Sheep need discerning shepherds that, that love them enough to protect the flock by standing their ground for gospel truth and speaking against charlatans and false teachers like that. And Paul says to the Ephesians at the end of verse 31, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears, he says, with tears. And Paul's life is a case study of, of pastoral vigilance for all elders, for all pastors, for all church leaders. Paul's example is what all of us can learn from, but it's also an example of what church members can expect from their elders as well. And can I make a plug here for, for church membership? I mentioned in Hebrews 13 verse 7 at the beginning of the sermon, obey your leaders and submit to them for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. 
And the implication of this verse is that leaders are responsible. We are responsible for church members only. The ones who are on the roll. The ones that we will give an account for. Others will give an account for those who have committed themselves to the, the local church. Elders are responsible to keep watch over the souls of their members, not the attendees. You know, we, we pray for people in our church directory, and we put the photographs on the, the screen for everybody to see who we're praying for. And you may have noticed that some of those photographs are in color, and some of those photographs are in black and white. We distinguish those who are members and those who are attendees. The members are in color, and those who are attendees are in black and white. But as elders, we are responsible for those who are our members. I mean, we pray for everyone who needs prayer, but we are accountable. We will give an account to God, not for those who haven't committed to our church, who haven't committed to us. We will give an account to God for those who have committed to us in membership. If you're not a church member, you are an easy picking for hungry wolves. If you're not willing to submit to the leadership of the church, you are an easy picking for hungry wolves. And Satan walks around like a lion seeking those he can devour. There's a reason the Lord has given us church leaders and elders who conform and who qualify to the biblical standards is really to protect us, is to protect you, is to protect your family. And you need to take advantage, as the passage says, take advantage of this, as we read about in Hebrews 13. Take advantage of the elders here at New Life Church by becoming a committed member of New Life Church. And lastly, we see in verse 32, we see the concern for hope and inheritance. In verse 32, Paul says, And now I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Well, in this verse, Paul is committing this group of elders to the Lord and to His, his word for, for studying and preaching. And notice the phrase there, the word of His grace there in verse 32. And Paul is referring firstly to the gospel, the biblical gospel, but he's also referring to the whole written word of God, everything that is in the Bible. And he's saying elders should be able to handle the word of God accurately. They should be able to defend the biblical gospel and again, at the risk of sounding repetitious, Christians need to be led by elders who know and love the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And most doctrinal errors come from a misunderstanding or a, even a deliberate perversion of God's free grace. And the Roman Catholic Church denies God's grace by, by mixing it with human works that are that they teach are necessary for salvation. They teach you need to do that and you need to do this and you need to do so many Hail Marys. And another false twisting of the gospel that has crept into the church is the doctrine of, of legalism and the attempt either to justify or to sanctify yourself by, by your own works. And Paul, Paul attacked that doctrine. Remember in the book of Galatians, he spoke out about that. He in the book of Romans, those books specifically were written to confront this, this false doctrine of legalism. Really, any system of righteousness through human works, it glorifies man, doesn't it, at the end of the day? It glorifies man and it, it feeds our human pride, what we can do, what we can achieve. And it's a false doctrine. Nothing we do can earn us salvation. It is a gift of God by His grace. We have a responsibility to submit to that and call upon Him for the forgiveness of our sins. But it is God who saves us. We don't save ourselves. 
Another twisting of the gospel is that of the health, wealth, and the prosperity gospel. This gospel promises Christians a healthy and a financially prosperous life if only they are faithful enough. And the problem with this teaching is that people place their hope in what God gives even over and above God Himself. It is a perversion of the, the biblical gospel. And elders must understand and they must personally live by and constantly teach God's word of grace. Why? Because it is this biblical understanding of the gospel and the correct teaching of it that as verse 32 says, look there in verse 32, is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Trusting in a false gospel will not build you up. Believing a lie will not give you hope. Trusting in a false gospel gives you a false hope. But trusting in the gospel of grace will strengthen you spiritually, will build you up and mature you in the faith so that you can resist the schemes of the devil. It is also... It also can give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. We spoke a little bit about this on Wednesday night at, the, at, our, um, at our potluck fellowship. And the inheritance here refers to the future fulfillment of all of God's promises of salvation to those that believe in Jesus Christ. It is only those who are sanctified, those who are holy, those who are born again, those who are in their standing before God and in their daily walk who have this inheritance that we can look forward to that is in heaven for us. And this is what we have to look forward to, and we need to look forward to this. We shouldn't be looking forward to the things of this world where moth and and rust can corrupt. We need to be looking forward to our eternal inheritance in heaven, which is eternal, which doesn't fade away which gives us a sure hope, not a false hope, where our joy should come from. We need to be reminded of this by submitting ourselves to the authority of Scripture. Our joy is not in this world. Our joy is not in some substance that we end up abusing that temporarily relieves us of our problems. Our joy is not in the arms of a a strange man or a strange woman. Our joy is in Jesus Christ, who is seated at the right hand of God the Father. And we look forward to that day where we will bow our knees and confess that He is Lord and worship Him together. Do you trust the Bible? Do you believe? Do you believe the Bible to be the Word of God? Is it, is it truthful? You know, Paul said in 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17, All Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching. It is profitable for reproof. It is profitable for correction and for training in righteousness. That the man of God or woman of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. We need to be reminded that the Word of God is sufficient. We need to be reminded that this is our authority, that we need to be submitting to the Scriptures. There is simply nothing else in the world that is able to to build us up in our holy faith and strengthen us like the Word of God can, like the God-breathed Scripture that has been handed down to us. No amount of psychological self-help books or conferences will be able to build us up like the Word of God can. If you are a visitor here today, please please hear this. Make sure you become a member of a Bible teaching church. I like what one Christian blogger said. He said, if you want to go to a church where the pastor has wax on his fingers from tickling ears each week, delivering sermonettes for Christianettes, 
massaging your conscience by telling you what you want to hear, then you will be miserable. You will be miserable because if you are a Christian, you want to be like Christ. And your church choice should not revolve around the children's ministry, but rather the pulpit ministry of the church. And not because they teach sermonettes, short messages, but because they teach you the Word of God. They are faithful in delivering to you the, the biblical Word of God. In New Life Church, we, we, your elders, are committed to preaching the Word of God to you. And we work hard at, at rightly dividing the Word of Truth for your benefit, for our benefit as well, but for your benefit. We are fully convinced that the correct teaching of, of God's Word, as it says in verse 32, is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. We believe that. But take advantage of that. Take advantage of this for the sake of your own soul, for the sake of your, your own marriage, for the sake of your children. Organize your schedule so that you are under our teaching. Join our home groups. Join our Bible studies. Join our family Bible hour. I just met this week with a couple from our church who who are struggling in their marriage. And I asked him, well, why haven't you been at church for the last three months? Don't you think there's, there's a connection between what's happening in your marriage and the fact that you are away from the Lord and away from the people of God and away from the teaching of His Word? Don't you think there's a connection? If you're not taking advantage of being preached to, why do you act surprised when these things happen to you. Help us, New Life Church, help you watch over your souls by filling your heart and mind with truth that will set you free so that you don't believe the lies of your boss, so that you don't believe the lies of that ungodly man or woman who wants to take advantage of you. You take advantage of us, folks, by letting us teach you God's truth. And our commitment to teach God's word is of no advantage to you if you are not around for us to teach you. Be teachable. Be available. If you're not being fed meat, you will be ill-equipped to fulfill your responsibilities to train your own family, to lead your wife, and your children. You know, it's as ridiculous as having cool toys for your, for your kids at home while you are, are dumpster diving on the way home from work looking for dinner. It doesn't make sense, does it? And the priority for the Christian is to be taught the Word of God that they may be built up in the truth according to the likeness of the Son of God to the glory of God. All to the glory of God. Not to the glory of the elders. Not to the glory of New Light Church but to the glory of God. And lastly, I have, I've used a lot of farming words like flock and sheep and shepherds, and that is because the Bible uses those words to help us understand our relationship to the, to the shepherd of our souls, who is Jesus Christ. But let me finish this morning by asking you, are you a sheep or are you a goat? A sheep, as we've seen, belongs to Jesus Christ. A goat tries to be part of the flock, but is not really a sheep. It is a goat. A goat is a rejecter of the shepherd. A goat doesn't listen to the shepherd. A goat is a rejecter of Jesus Christ. If you are a goat, well, I have bad news for you. Christ has promised one day that he will separate the sheep and the goats. And he will judge the goats at the second coming. The sheep inherit the kingdom. But the goats are excluded and the goats are, are judged. And unbelievers will face the eternal wrath of God. But I want to finish with some good news, okay? Good news for you if you are an unbelieving goat. You can become a believing sheep. And you say, how? 
Well, the Bible says you must accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and Shepherd. Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 7 and verse 9, He said, I am the door of the sheep. If anyone enters through me, he shall be saved. And the moment you receive Christ, the moment you receive Him as your Lord, you receive eternal life. And you become a true sheep of, of Christ, the great shepherd. And He gives you this promise. He says in John 10, verse 27 and 28, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Will you receive Christ and come into His fold and under His shepherdhood this morning? Are you a sheep or are you a goat? If you're not sure, please come and speak to us. Let us make sure today from the Word of God that you can be part of this eternal promise. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word today. And thank you, Lord, that you love us enough to give us these instructions. You love us enough to show us how we are to biblically order a church. You love us enough, Lord, to show us how we are to lead each other. And you are not lording these truths over us lord you are not a dictator you love us and we submit to you because we know that you love us and i pray lord that you would help us as elders to follow your example to love the sheep and lead them in love as you did and i pray lord that the members of new life church will know our love for them not in a way to hurt them but a way to benefit them in a way to Point them to this inheritance of eternal life. And Father, I pray, Father, that you would speak to those that need to be spoken to today, that have issues with authority, and are willing to submit to ultimately your authority. And I ask that you would grant repentance to those hearts today. But Lord, that you would help us to be a biblical church that honors you in every way, that we would stand firm that we would guard the flock, that we would guard each other, that we would help each other grow in the likeness of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For your glory, Lord, and for our joy, help us to live in conformity to the Scriptures as you have taught us today. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen.